Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. If there's one thing that you might say about Ray Haderman, it's that he's never been afraid to swim against the tide. Haderman is the publisher of the New York Review of Books, the unapologetically intellectual and progressive newspaper of ideas, arts, and culture. We live in an era when the news media has shifted not only away from print, but to shorter, more easily digestible stories and glib headlines aimed at winning Facebook and Twitter traffic. Older journalists are regularly laid off for younger, cheaper, and more tech-savvy counterparts. But under Haderman, the review remains something different. Published in print in tabloid newspaper format, each issue is carefully constructed around several lengthy essays. A recent edition featured a 3,500-word essay analyzing St. Paul and an even longer review of a new biography of the Italian Jewish writer and chemist Primo Levi. Robert Silvers, the review's longtime editor, was born during the Hoover administration. And yet, surprisingly, the review has not only not diminished, but continues to expand its readership and influence, uh, as well as remain financially successful. Much credit for that lies with Haderman. Earlier in his career, he fought with his newspaper-owning family members to change Jackson, Mississippi's Clarion Ledger newspaper from one of the country's most racist dailies into a Pulitzer-winning publication that not only hired and wrote about African Americans, but became a force for change in the Deep South. Ray Haderman, who recently won an Otter Medal from the Missouri School of jo Journalism, joins us now on the show. Ray, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, let's just start at the beginning then. Tell us, tell us about your early years. Tell us about how you grew up in Mississippi. Well, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I was born in 1944, so my whole time there spanned the period of civil rights activism uh, in the South. And that it was something that influenced me as well as I think everyone who grew up there who has to at some point make a decision whether you will be for segregation or whether you will be against segregation. And that becomes a parting point for many people uh, in the South. Um, I went to public school all the way through, which had no uh, minority students. Um, and then, um, th then I went to college and graduate school in Missouri and then began to work for my family newspapers. And tell us why, why did you choose to study journalism? You ended up coming to the University of Missouri. I had never planned on working in journalism. Uh, the reputation of my family's papers was such that it was an embarrassment and there were uh, a number of things that were written in the papers that I was deeply ashamed of. So For example? I, well, after the Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream speech in Washington, the headline on my family's paper was, Washington Clean Again with Negro Trash Removed. And that was one of those short little AP fillers that talked about how many tons of trash was collected. They do it after every march in Washington, how many tons of trash was collected after march. And that became the front page banner headline story uh, of my family's paper. That is what I call deeply embarrassing. <laughs> and so I, I uh, wanted to get away from it, but every, everywhere I went um, outside the South, I, people knew the story of the papers and knew my last name. Um, not everyone, but enough to be uh, embarrassing to me. So I made a decision to go back to the Mississippi and try and change these papers. And if I couldn't change it, I would at least have tried and I would, would feel much better about myself for having tried. Well, let me back you up then. So while you were in journalism school, did you start thinking about the newspaper business in a new or different way? Well, I went when I decided to go back to Mississippi, I had never taken any journalism courses. So I knew I had to learn something about journalism before going back to this newspaper. And so I came to the University of Missouri because it had a uh, journalism program that actually taught reporting and editing and photography and the, the, its graduates can actually go immediately to work for a daily newspaper and that's what I needed. I needed to teach myself those things in order to to be able to do that. And so you went back to Mississippi and you started working for a small newspaper then, is that correct, for a weekly newspaper? Right. I went to, um, I was on the international program here and, um, and, and I went to Brussels, Belgium for the last six months or so of, of my time here. And I was in Brussels, Belgium one week before 
Christmas and right after New Year's Day, I was editor of this weekly newspaper in Canton, Mississippi that my family owned. It was a small community, 10,000 population, 6,000 black, 4,000 white. It ended up being the week that the Supreme Court decision came down saying that busing could be used in order to affect desegregation in public schools. Up until that point, after the Brown decision, there was desegregation, but in practice there was almost no desegregation in the Deep South. This busing order changed that entirely, and it was at that point that so many uh, white-only academies grew up in, in the, all over the South, and Canton, Mississippi being a minority of whites, immediately formed a uh, white-only academy. So and what were some of the challenges that you ran into in covering this story then? The, the, um, there's a federal court order that no one could take equipment out of, or furniture or anything out of the public schools, and of course immediately the community began taking everything from the public schools, including uh, bleachers and lights from the football stadium and installing them in. And I began to write about that, which... Taking them out of the public schools, moving them to these new white-only academies. Right, one white-only academy, Canton Academy. And um, that was... Um, I began writing about that, which drew an enormous amount of, um, of hatred and mail and death threats because at that time all of these white only academy people working in them felt that it was a mission it, it became almost like a religious experience we have to go out and we have to start these schools because bad things are going to happen if we have to go to the public school so the whole community was in a furor uh, trying to to put these schools together raise money and as part of raising money they were free they were pilfering equipment from the public schools, stripping them of the of equipment. Um, so that was uh, a very tough time for me to be in my first uh, <laughs> really newspaper job. Sort of trial by fire, and it sounds like what you're saying is that the newspaper in Canton, Mississippi hadn't covered these issues of race and civil rights in a similar fashion previously. Then. No, and, and but this, it had not, but this was also a new issue where, where when the Supreme Court decision came down, that immediately changed the entire community. Um, and, and that had to be reported on. So it, it, it became, to me, an obligation to write about it. But I was writing about it in a way that I saw factually accurate, which was equipment being taken away. People being almost coerced into to raising money, uh, into giving money to the school. I mean, you made to feel if you didn't give money that, that you were anti-community. Um, it just became a cause, and, and to go against a cause created a lot of dissension. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Joining us in studio is Ray Haderman, the publisher of the New York Review of Books since 1984. Before that, he helped transform Jackson, Mississippi's Clarion Ledger newspaper into a Pulitzer winner. A reminder that if you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. I wanted to ask you, we just mentioned the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi. So you have been in Canton, Mississippi. You moved to your family's other larger newspaper right. in Jackson, the Clarion Ledger. Tell us about, tell us about that. Um, the ed the longtime editor of the Clarion Ledger retired, and uh, my family asked me to, to. I'd been in Canton for three years to come down and to work in the newsroom. And this is in the early Clarion 1970s. Ledger. This was 1973, I believe it was. And I, I went. I didn't have a uh, title. I wasn't given a title. I was just told to work in the newsroom. Um, I felt there were a lot of improvements that needed to be made to the paper. Uh, for example, uh, it was a publicist's, publicist's dream. Uh, someone like the Chamber of Commerce could walk in and hand a press release to someone in the newsroom and to be run verbatim in the newspaper. And there was actually a special uh, marker, color, for press releases that were just to be typeset and put into the paper. And uh, so that was you know, one of the many practices that immediately stopped. Uh, we used to use uh, the Associated Press to cover uh, 
city hall meetings and to cover the state capitol, which was two blocks away from where the newspaper offices were. So all of this entailed hiring reporters who could actually come in and begin to report on what was going on. So that was the immediate challenge, was to begin to put out a newspaper that, that had uh, good reportage. And the newspaper, as you had mentioned, had been covering the civil rights movement in a very different way than papers elsewhere in the nation were. That began to change under your tenure. Can you tell us a bit about some of those changes that you undertook, and what was your family's reaction to these? The, um, as, as we began to, to get better reporters and, and began to actually write original stories, many of the stories would begin to affect my family's business interests as well as um, friends of family. So there was a lot of pressure from my family to... Who specifically, from your father or from... My father was, uh, was always supportive of what I was doing. I don't think, though he never said it, I don't think he agreed with a number of the stories that we wrote, particularly uh, when we would do like a long series of stories on police brutality against blacks. I think that was probably something that he you know, would rather us not have done, but he always supported us being able to do with it. So there were five families, and uh, my father always supported, always supported me, and um, and one other family always did, but in the end, uh, three out of the five said I should go, and that, and they uh, terminated my, my employment there. Okay. <laughs> so ultimately you ended up getting fired by your own family yes. at the Clarion Ledger. That's right. And was there a specific story or specific impetus that led your family to, to dismiss you? I, I don't think there was a particular story. There were, there were a lot of stories um, that we did that impacted uh, the community and impacted the family. There were, our stories resulted in a large number of public officials being indicted. Uh, changes in a variety of the way different organizations worked, um, changed in sports coverage. Uh, there were anger from both the two major football uh, universities about coverage because we began to cover sports as a news story, not just as a publicity relationship. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of stories going on, and um, I, it, it could be any one of a large number of stories to tell you. Okay, <laughs> so it wasn't simply a matter of you, I understand you hired African-American reporters, you started covering African-Americans in a different way than the Clarion Ledger had in the past, but it sounds like the discontent from within your family was much broader than simply around the coverage of civil rights then. Yes, yes. It had to do with civil rights, but also had to do with friends. You know, newspa newspaper families and communities, all that's changed now with, uh, you know, the, there are not very many family-owned newspapers left. Um, but they were always very important in communities. They had a lot of friends, they had a lot of people who wanted to be friends with them because they wanted to influence the coverage of the paper and so on. And I kept myself isolated uh, from the community in a certain way, and our reporters were isolated. We mainly were a small unit, and we, we stories that we worked on, we did not disclose to anybody else in the newspaper building for fear that there would be family interference. And, uh, and often there was. It would get out before the story was actually published. So, we, so that was something I always had to, had to deal with. And uh, a lot of anger toward me. One, one of, the, um, one of the, the things I think that made them particularly angry was when we won the um, Robert Kennedy Award uh, for journalism, they, several members of our family said, we have never liked the Kennedys and we don't think we should accept this award. And at that time the award was given by Ted Kennedy at, um, at Ethel Kennedy's home. And people had worked hard on this story. It had to do against, uh, I think it was North Mississippi justice. It was about the way justice for blacks was handed out in North Mississippi compared to justice for whites. And it won the grand prize in addition to winning the print prize. And I felt it was unfair for all of these reporters who had worked so much on it. So I myself paid for eight of us to go to collect the award uh, at Ethel Kennedy's home. And I remember when um, 
Ole Miss was desegregated under John Kennedy. And I remember Ted Kennedy saying to me, he said, is this the same newspaper that was there when we were trying to get Meredith into Ole Miss? Because my family's paper had an editorial one day that said, every white right-thinking Mississippian will take their gun and go to Oxford and make sure that James Meredith doesn't enroll in Ole Miss. And he well knew that because John Kennedy had to send in the National Guard um, to protect him. And still, there were, I think, three or four people killed during riots there. And of course, the newspaper won a Pulitzer Prize shortly after your family fired you. Then. Yes, that's right. So uh, let's walk forward then a little bit. You leave the Clarion Ledger in 1982 after this falling out with your family. In 1984, you bought the New York Review. It was reported on at the time for about $5 million. Why did you buy an intellectual's newspaper? Not many people would say, oh, I have $5 million to invest. I'm going to go buy this newspaper that publishes 5,000-word essays about Voltaire. Mm. Um, to me, the, the – well, if you look at the New York Review of Books, the – of books is smaller type than the New York Review. And that's so that the New York Review can write about anything it wants to. Any, any subject is open to be written about by the New York Review. And that making that of book small opens the paper up completely. And the one thread through the New York Review and the thread I feel like through my life has always been a respect for human rights and to try and be a defender of human rights. And the New York Review uh, has always done that. When uh, Andrei Sakharov was imprisoned under house arrest in Gorky, he would smuggle out faxes to the New York Review and we would run fax material. We would run those pieces in the review. I think we read 10 pieces by him in the review. The same with Václav Havel when he was uh, writing plays in Prague and then became the leader of the revolution in, in Prague and eventually became its president. But the whole Thing. And you mentioned Helen Epstein earlier on Ethiopia. The whole the, the New York Review has always been a defender and a champion of human rights, and and that's what drew me to it uh, initially. Well, tell me, you didn't put your name on the masthead of the review for several years after you purchased it, right? Why was that? I, I feel like uh, editorial publications are editorially driven publications are very sensitive to change. And I didn't want it to look in any way like here's a new owner coming in and, and feels like he's got to do this. He has to make that change, make this change. And, the, and um, I felt it was important for me not to be there. I worked there, but I didn't put my name on it for some time. I just didn't want to look like I was forcing anything through uh, on anyone. This is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're joined in studio today by Ray Haderman, publisher of the New York Review of Books and a recent winner of a Missouri Honor Medal. A reminder that if you're interested in more Global Journalist content, visit us online at globaljournalist.org. There you can read in-depth articles on international affairs and free press issues, and download past episodes from our archive. We're also on social media. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. Uh, Ray Haderman, I wanted to ask you, how, how do you define the value of what the review does? Well, I think it's... Um, I think it's a collection of the best writers writing on the most important subjects. And that gives information to a widespread community. Uh, so while our circulation is relatively small, it's 135,000 print and 15,000 digital, uh, it has influence that reverberates out. Uh, for example, in the, in the last issue, uh, the White House asked us if we would publish an interview that Obama had with Marilyn Robinson, uh, and we did, and we, we ran it in two parts. But that got an enormous amount of, of attention. Even though our subscribers are, as I say, relatively small, it, it, it just radiates out. And, and that's an example of, I think, the influence of the review and the influence that the review can have. And I think it's it's... Uh, you know, one other example is we were always opposed to the war in Iraq. We always thought it was a bad idea. We were – Mark Danner, one of our contributors uh, – we have no staff writers. They're all commissioned. Uh, but Mark is a longtime contributor, and he's the first one to write about the torture and the specifics of torture, and he got the Red Cross report. 
And this became national news. And that, to me, is, uh, is, is a lot of the importance of the New York Review. How, how would you say that the New York Review has changed during your tenure? Well, I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't think that it has changed. Um, it's, it's had the same editor. Uh, we had our 50th anniversary last year, and it, we've had the same editor uh, ever since the, the first issue. We've always done what is now called long-form journalism, but we've been doing it for years. The, very, the early issues had shorter pieces, but for the last 35, 40 years, we've had our average uh, length is probably 4,000 words. Um, even when we started uh, blogs on our website, our blogs, which we now call New York Review Daily, are 2,000 words generally. So, it's, uh, so they're like small New York Review pieces. You talked about sort of the consistency that the review has had and how little it's changed since you took over uh, in 1984. And the fact that you've had the same editor, Robert Silvers, who was born, I think I mentioned, during the Hoover administration. He's 85 years old now. Does the New York Review, what happens to it after he's no longer the editor? Well, it, it will continue to go on. It will probably... It will have to change in some way. Any new editor has got, you know, is there going to be changes? But I think it will still be driven by human rights, by quality, uh, by quality writing, by attracting the best writers, and and that will be the continuum. There will certainly, almost certainly, be certain things that are that are different. It has to be with a different editor. That'll and is there a, a successor that's been named or tapped? No, or? no, no. As Bob always says, we're thinking about the next issue. <laughs> The New York Review, uh, you know, you can get you can get the app. It, I looked it up online. It has an Instagram account. You're on Twitter, and yet you do occupy this kind of interesting space in the media world, where your readership is it's heavily academic. It's professors, researchers, authors, skews male uh, men in their sixties. Is that sort of the readership that you foresee for it in the future? And how do you keep them sort of at a time when we've seen enormous change uh, and upheaval for magazines and newspapers? Well, our, our, our online um, presence is skewing younger and, and uh, more diverse. Um, so that's, that's having a change. Uh, we have uh, probably 170,000 people that receive our newsletters with, with – uh, information in it and with pieces in it, referring them to pieces. So that's a large part of people who don't subscribe. Many of them don't subscribe to the review, but they are actively reading the review uh, online, at least reading parts of it. And, and those are definitely a much younger group. We're also uh, publishing, we started about 11 years ago, actively publishing books. And those readers who buy our books also skew younger, and they're more female than they are male. So. Uh, all of these little strands, I think, will will begin to change the uh, overall uh, readership of the review. We talked about Newsweek, U.S. News, some of these other you know well-known publications are either bankrupt or have changed dramatically, um, and we've seen sort of a rise of outlets like Vice and BuzzFeed that have just been very successful in attracting sort of a wide wide audience. Is that also a threat for the New York Review that? given how low distribution costs are on the Internet, that someone else could come into this space? Well, oddly, uh, Vice is probably the most successful of the online uh, news venues, and w we actually have a collaboration with them where they uh, do programs probably once a month with, our with one of our contributors on one of the stories that contribute to the review. So we have not... Uh, it doesn't mean it won't change in the future, but we haven't seen it. Our circulation continues to increase every year. We, in print, our advertising is flat, which I think is is remarkable. Um, very, I think that's a very strong indication of of where we are, and we are continuing to bring in digital subscribers. So we're our tra trajectory is we've never had a higher circulation than we have right now, even with all the digital threats that are there. But I, I do think part of it is is that. So much of, uh, of digital publication early on were short pieces, and uh, and we've always had running 3,500 to 4,000 word, and I think words per article, and I think people like that, and people want and need information, and we're continuing to provide that for them. What's the best memory that you have of your career? <laughs> 
Well, I, th I think in, in a lot of ways, uh, maybe celebrating the uh, 50th anniversary of the New York Review, which was a time to go back and, and, and to see just what the magazine has done over 50 years. And uh, Martin Scorsese produced a documentary on the, on the review, and, and that they did an enormous amount of work that, that brought back all of this uh, memories to us about great pieces that had run uh, over the years. So that was a very uh, satisfying year. The, the, for my time in Mississippi, the things that were most satisfying are the, uh, I feel like, a number of wrongs that we helped right. Uh, people who were wrongly accused uh, saw justice. Uh, a number of state officials and others were uh, convicted of felonies, uh, all on the basis of reporting that we did. And that, and that, to me, was very satisfying. I think it's made it a more equitable community in Mississippi. Uh, even though I'm not there, <laughs> but I believe it's I believe it still is. How do you think the review's evolution would have been different if it was held by a publicly traded company? Oh well, I think that I think a publicly traded company may very well have said we need to run shorter articles. We need to have uh, more pop, um, more popular pieces in it. It would not uh, the idea that you could go off and have Oliver Sacks write about colorblindness uh, wouldn't cross their mind. It's like, how many people want to read about colorblind? And I think that they would have pressed using uh, readership surveys to say, you know, we can get more readers if, if, if we sort of dumb down the publication. We write shorter pieces. We write more popular pieces. And I, I, I think that's the way it would have changed. And there are, in many, of course, many instances where that is act, exactly what has happened. But you're not immune to pop culture because I saw that the publication did do a long story about Game of Thrones, for instance. Yes. So. Well, we do. We do cover pop culture. But that pop culture piece was 4,000 words. And I think, you know, if you were changing it, you would say we want uh, 500 words on the Game of Thrones and we want it juicy and we want uh, a variety of other things. This was a serious piece about about Game of Thrones, but a very entertaining piece. Well, our time does grow short. We do have just a few seconds left. Where do you see the review three years from now, five years from now? I see it doing exactly the same thing it's doing now. No changes whatsoever? No, no, no changes. <laughs> well, Ray Haderman, thanks so much for joining us on Global Journalist. Congratulations on your Missouri Honor Medal. Thank you very much. That'll do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Global Journalist Executive Producer is Joshua Kranzberg. Our Associate Producers this week are Javila Ruskiskate, Elenia Kaya, and Joe Hang. Our Studio Director is Travis McMillan from RJI. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for joining us.